Okay, so here we are, uh, session yeah. 10. I think it's actually okay. Everybody is here. Session 10 or 8? 10, I think. Okay. We're in the middle of the group of three, correct? Yeah, it actually yeah. says 7, 8, and 9 are September 28th, 30th, and October 5th. Okay, so it must be. Sorry, it must be eight. Yeah. You're right, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the body of the interview assessment, that is the interview assessment uh, itself. The body of the interview, we'll come back to that in a second. But I forgot that uh, one group didn't present their their work on the service plan, so take the way people there, boys. Okay. Mohan and I uh, worked on the math section. We also had printed out last week copies of our modifications and passed it out to the various groups. If you guys could please pull that out and help us out a little bit. I believe, if I remember correctly, the first section was in regards to uh, talking calculators. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you want us to just read it to you, Paul? Okay. Uh, under Mathematics, Section 7, Letter A, upon completion of the Adaptive Calculator Training Unit, the learner will use a calculator at a level sufficient to meet his or her daily needs. Okay. And then the second one, wasn't it a uh, voice activated or a voice synthesized calculator? Uh, the thing I just read was letter A. Okay. And then uh, part B under mathematics is at the completion of the abacus training unit, the learner will perform the four basic mathematical functions at a level necessary to meet his or her daily needs. And then if I'm not mistaken, that is all under mathematics. And then That's each right. one has four or five. Okay. That's right. There's two different goal possibilities there. There's another math two, of course, is Braille mathematics, then with code, but that would be under Braille, not under this part. So we're talking mostly here about uh, people, two kinds of people. Um, if you lose, well, what, what's an abacus first? Anybody know? It's like an old yeah. school calculator. <laughs> it's like beads. It's, it's, it's from where? China. Yeah. It's from Asia or you know, a lot. There's several. There's at least two major forms of it. One comes from Asia. One comes from Japan. They have one has one kind of beads and another one has another. They're, they're two different things, but they have the same sort of theory. But in essence, they're something that they still use there instead of a cash register in little, little shops. So when you pay your whatever, 95% of your, of your uh, per, you pay 100 per, you give 100%, you only want 95, then when they make change, they, with that, with that flipping beads around on the advocates, show you your change and everybody knows how to use it so they say that's cool and then they give you a change just like like, like you do like they do at uh, Circuit City only not with an abacus <clears throat> and it's old it's old school yes tactile it's, it's um, it is tactile so it has some advantages. It's not used very much, but it's, what do you do if you send somebody off to community college and they have to take remedial math, can they use a calculator? Do you think a remedial math teacher at KVCC would let you use a calculator in a remedial math board? Sums and multiplication? No. It wouldn't. But they let you use this. And what, what we learned, well, I should taught us the abacus in our communication devices class, and I thought the coolest thing was it gives you the equivalent of a pen and paper. 
like to do simple math problems. It gives kids who are blind or adults who are blind that pen and paper ability. It or does. writing down a phone number. It does. Yeah. It does, but it's uh, all those things are true, but it is extremely difficult to learn. I mean, it takes, it takes hours and hours to teach you, who, even somebody at the university level, who, even if you have good math skills, it takes a while to learn all of it. Because all you're doing is learning where to put your fingers and where to move things. You're not even doing math. You only have to know math facts to nine to, to use an abacus. It's all just rote, flip, flip, flip. You do this when you see that. So it takes a lot of learning. So the only time you really ever teach it to anybody is if they really, really had a big problem. And the major problem would be somebody definitely blind and didn't have braille or didn't have braille ability. But occasionally you run into that person who has to go to remedial math at a junior or at the community college. Um, so they are still really, I mean, they're used, just not much. Very seldom. However, it's, <laughs> you probably won't teach it in the curriculum here because it takes, it takes so long to learn. But we might teach you like the very basic. If, we, if you learn math, I mean, if you learn sums, adding, then the rest of it comes very simply by looking at the book because you just have to learn the concept of borrowing and blah, blah, blah. Fairly. Once you get the concept, it's not that hard. <clears throat> but it's, it's it's like Braille. It's not maybe not used by a huge group of population, but some people need it badly, and it takes a long time to learn. Anyway, that's the advocates. Sorry. Go ahead. Actually, go ahead and read. So yeah. that's okay. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and read uh, A because you have a change that relates to it. Remember A was, upon completion of the adaptive calculator training unit, the learner will use the calculator at a level sufficient to meet his or her daily needs. And you guys wanted to change that to independently? Yeah. Why? What's the difference? I believe that the goal of this uh skill that, I mean, doesn't represent... It's curve. given that it's independently, if you say, to meet his or her daily needs. It's a given that, it, that they're doing it on their own. <clears throat> Unless you have another, another reason. Anytime you write it that way, it's, it's, a, it's assumed that you mean without help. Okay. okay. So, do you mean like that independently, or that doesn't make sense. This, this I'm place. saying it's saying the same thing. It is saying the same thing, but independently is a little bit more concise. I think is what we focused on. Well, okay. It seems I'm the final judge. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it happens. In the <laughs> And then uh, letter B, I'm just going to read it again. At the completion of the abacus training unit, the learner will perform the four basic mathematical functions at a level necessary to meet his or her daily needs. And you guys said replace, quote, at a level necessary with 95% accuracy. Yeah, you could do that. But I don't know if that's necessary. Is 95% accuracy good enough if you're paying your bank bill? Is it? No. That's the problem with that's the problem with coming up with numbers. Uh, however, maybe it is good enough because maybe we don't need to have people do it that well by the time they leave us. Because what you're going to find is you really don't have time to. Uh, you know how you zip through this program? <laughs> hmm? yeah. It isn't any different when you're teaching somebody on the other side. The uh, learners on, in the, who are hard in rehab, also you don't have enough time with. So 95% probably is okay as long as you understand and tell them that they got to get better if they don't really reach 98 or 99%. You see what I mean? Yep. <coughs> 
it looks like you guys left numbers one through four and one through five under B as they were, and then you added letter C. At the completion of the mathematical adapted technology lesson, the learner will independently complete the lessons at a level sufficient to complete basic mathematical functions, parentheses, add, subtract, multiply, and divide with 95% accuracy. Are there any kind of new things in math <coughs> besides the talking calculator? In this section, we were adding uh, use of a computer both uh, for low vision with magnification as Your well calculators. as calculators uh -huh. okay and anything else as well as a uh, computer using a braille display or a voice synthesizer for mathematics right okay anything else are there other kinds of calculators you can't hit uh there's a scientific calculator yeah, i'd add that these days because there's Fairly sophisticated, and some of them are pretty accessible. And even, even the even the scientific calculator on this little PK here is quite good. Do they also have accessible business calculators? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know for sure. My guess is yes. So my question. You could I'm write it. You could write it kind of generically. Uh, advanced calculators yeah something like that yes. that's okay. what i was just going to ask as opposed to because there's lots of ways yeah you know, you're right <laughs> I'd, I'd write it more generically because it'll change also it'll, it'll become more sophisticated all the time okay did you do anything i assume you didn't do anything with abacus you couldn't possibly know too much about it I don't except, think we except did. for wording. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think wording is basically it. Um, you guys did add two, three items under C, and the first one is when presented with an electronic note taker, the learner will, in a given random sequence consisting of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and or division, will solve problems containing ten four-digit numbers correctly three times in a row. All you really need is the outcome. You don't need all that given stuff because that's in your lesson plan. You're dead right, of course. When you when you do the lesson plan, you, just, you write that stuff in. But when you're just choosing, when you're just writing out this extremely already extremely long document, probably wouldn't write all those all those givens in there. You can though. I mean, I wouldn't argue with it, but. If you had to sit down and write out this whole thing made up yourself and you put that kind of specific in there, you'd be pretty tired of You'd probably quit two-thirds of the way through and set it down until summer vacation. But, I mean, you're right. You do need that kind of specificity and you do need to know those things. But generally, it's in the lesson plan after the pub. Uh, yeah. It's the same thing with how you do it. Sometimes it's you want to write how you're going to do it in this in this objective, but you don't need to because it's it's going to be a four-page or three-page lesson plan on how you're going to teach that at adaptive calculation. Um, number two says, when presented with an appropriate magnification device, the learner will com correctly complete a math problem. And I guess you guys will probably want to skip the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division part. But if you, you just could say up through division. Oh, okay. Then you don't need all the words. I mean, it's a given that division is the more the most complicated of four. So. All right. So it really says when presented with an appropriate magnification device, the learner will complete correctly complete a math problem up through division containing ten four-digit numbers correctly three times in a row. How is again the correctly is correctly is redundant. Because you're assuming that. I'm sorry, how is the learner doing it with the magnification? I mean, he's talking about magnifiers, I think. So, right? I mean, is this by he's hand? talking about a handheld magnifier or something yes. like that? Or yeah. somebody who's low vision. Talking about somebody who's low vision, yeah. But, I mean, is the person then using the magnifier and like a pencil and paper? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yes. But again, you, know, you don't need that specific until you get to the lesson plan. As long as you know what it is. But that is what it means. 
Okay, and then the last one, number three, when presented with an appropriate software. Probably I wouldn't call it a magnifier though, because low vision aids are specifically defined as four or five different types. Magnification is one type, telescopes and mag microscopes and blah, blah, blah. I would simply say a low vision device. It doesn't like me with a microscope, which isn't a magnifier. Okay. Kind of, it's kind of a magnifier, but it's not classified as that. I mean, I'm getting technical here, but when you get to the low vision touch, you see. Excuse me, Paul. Yeah. Does, is somebody really going to use a microscope to do? Uh -huh. Well, the things on your face are called microscopes. Oh. Re reading lenses on your face are microscopes. Oh. And they're telescopes if they're if they're. Uh, mounted in your lenses and you're using them for distance yeah that's a telescope but if you're re if you're using a, a, a lens mounted in your glasses or whatever and you're reading with it that is a microscope or it's a telemicroscope meaning the the the, the, the focal distance is very short your face is all right down on the paper or you've got the paper up in your face you can get you can get like if you have a handheld magnifier, you get very little uh, right. increase in size. But with a microscope, you can get huge increases. And you decrease the field like crazy. So you have run into other problems. But microscope is a very good way to read if you're with, with a lot of training. <laughs> OK. It's just like, like I just said to him. There, there are these categories, magnifiers, <laughs> microscopes, telemicroscopes, telescopes. Okay, number three says, when presented with an appropriate software equipped magnification or synthesized computer, the learner will correctly complete a math problem up through division containing ten four-digit numbers correctly three times in a row. Okay, cool. Anybody think of anything else in math? There are, we have graphics in the other sections we might add graphics here, like uh, especially mm, some some scientific graphs. Follow. You know, if you're taking a class in uh, sociology or, or statistics or whatever, and they're presenting specific kinds of graphs, then you might need. I need some sort, some way to do graphic, graphical uh, representations of, of, of what they're doing. We have it also under handwriting, but that has kind of a different, different intention. That's more to show pictures and, and to show uh, concepts. Like this is how a block is laid out. And this is the shape of the cylinder. Whereas this is a mathematical graph. So I probably would add it here now. That wouldn't be in the computer section. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be. But again. But in both sections, maybe? It could be. It just depends on how the. It would depend on how, in your agency, it, it ended up being categorized. <laughs> in this case, I guess I'd put it in both places for now. But not in, not in computer. Because it's not the computer that really does it. It's the, it's the software and blah, well, it's the printer and it's not the computer. It's associated with the computer, blah, blah, blah. There are specific gadgets that do it too, but I don't want to get that deep into it. This is good enough. Since there are so many different types of graphs, would you just keep it very generic and I explain would. how graphs are made? Yes, and I just call them mathematical graphs or statistical graphs or scientific graphs or something like that or both. Okay. Good. You guys have done really well with this. You weren't all here the other day, but <coughs> Tim wasn't. What? <laughs> yeah, you weren't here the other day. Well, the bus came asked, on time asked, today. You so. asked for co-authorship? Yes, I did. Well, matter of fact. Did, did they tell you what I told you? I burst his bubble on yes, the Yes, they did. Field. You broke your bubble? They told me. 
sorry. That's all right. I'm not really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so onward. Let's go back to assessment here. Thank you for doing that hard work. That's hard work. Uh, just for the record, they've still got another section. Do you want them to do that or not? No. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, let's go all the way back to assessment from the very beginning again. Do you have in your head all the kinds of assessments that happen in the four-step vocational rehabilitation process that, you, that the client would go through if they were picked up by the Michigan Commission for the Blind or any other state agency? What is that again? The four steps, I mean. First thing that happens is eligibility. eligibility. Right. All right, that, that's right. That group of things. You get determined eligible, then you get assessed for programmatically assessed, then you get a program, then you get sent off to who? The VA. Personal adjustment training. To all you guys, the teachers, yeah. personal adjustment training. And then when the personal adjustment is done, the skills are all set, then people go off to vocational, the vocational part. Now, if you go back and think about where people get assessed in this whole process, obviously the first thing is an assessment of determining eligibility. And then the big assessment to see what kind of a program you're going to have. And then we come to your assessment, the personal adjustment training assessment. Do I need to make a, a a written table for this to hand out? Would that help? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've got yes. five, are you talking? I've got five steps. There are five steps. Right? Okay. Yeah, but my note, Jen, says that the program plan is really not an assessment. It's just a I don't. Oh, no, I know that. Yeah. Right. But what five steps do you have? I have steps of assessment, training. Steps of what? I have eligibility, program assessment, and setting up a program plan, but that is not an assessment. And then... Um, Yep, personal adjustment training, and this is that's where we step in. I'm sorry, it is five steps. And then vocational training. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it is five steps. I said four. It's five things: eligibility, the assessment for the program, the program itself, personal adjustment training, and vocational training. I see you move to the second row, so I wouldn't break your computer today. What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You should have seen me in, in, in uh, Dave's class yesterday. I hit, I hit Kate in the head two or three times, <laughs> making gestures in front of the class. She got pretty good at ducking, so. Okay, that five-step process has how many assessments in it? The eligibility determination, the program assessment, and then the personal adjustment training assessment. And that that personal adjustment training assessment has. How many steps? What do you do first? What happens first when you're assessing a person who shows up at your door? You look at the file. That's right. You look at the file. Then interview. Then you do an interview. And then you observe. Then you observe. The, then you're going to write your own plan, which we're going to do. That's the next thing we're going to do after we talk, finish talking about assessment. All right. And then they go off to vocational training and they get another kind of assessment, which is a vocational assessment. Things like what are the ordinary job interests and all that. So there's lots of places, almost everywhere, there's an assessment. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's the most important thing. Can I like, ask a quick question? Sure. Can I, okay, we have our five-step uh, VR process. And then the three steps that we were just talking about, is that is that what we do as the teachers? That's, That's right. We step in, That's we view the file. Da, da, da. When the program, the third step is done in a program, the IPE is written. And if the IPE contains personal adjustment training, then you show up at the person's door and you do your little three-step assessment to see how you can help the IPE is written during the program plan, correct? That, that's right. That okay. is the program plan. So we could really call that like the three-step uh, assessment for personal adjustment training. That's what it is. Okay. And I'll make a little graph. 
to send you a little table. No, that's got to help because it is kind of, they're all intertwined, so I understand your, your problem with it. Um, okay, so you got this three step process. Then uh, you, you, we've talked about case files and all their parts and their strengths and weaknesses. And then we, last time we met, we talked about uh, the interview. And again, we got a whole bunch of parts here. We got four things you have to always, you always have to do when you're doing an interview. First thing is, you have to prepare for it. And that sounds silly, but like I said the other day, anytime you give any presentation, do any lesson, the first thing you do is prepare for it. You go out and you, you, you write a plan and you rehearse it. I think that would be true of any interview. It is. I mean, even if, I mean, if you're interviewing somebody for a job, they read your resume before they see you. Sure. Unless you've got a lot more nerve than I do. <laughs> I mean, I rehearse this class. I don't just walk in here. I sit down with the outline every day. I come in here beforehand, even the night before. I spend at least four hours preparing for this class every time. Um, anyway, so you, you rehearse it, you look up information in a file that's going to help you chat back and forth with this person in a normal way. You know, you know what job they did, you know how many kids they have, you know whether they're married or not married, or at least they were when, the, when you got the paperwork. And so you have lots of Lots of tools in your toolbox. You go out to the store and you feel better about yourself, and it's much easier to do because you're not, your teeth aren't chattering, and you don't have to like put a, a piece of rubber between your teeth, keep from breaking them because you will shake it. Can you ask the person to? Uh, oh, um, can when you interview him or her, for, for it to just be you and that person, and not to have like their significant Absolutely, other. and that's a great point. Say that again. You don't want anyone else in this in this uh, interview. You don't want a family member sitting there saying, oh yeah, she does that or doesn't do this, or oh my God, that's the worst thing on earth. But when doing the first assessment, yeah. it should just be you and them. Yeah, that can be hard to avoid though, can I it? Am. But what if, we'll what talk, if we're gonna talk about how to happen. deal with that kind of problem when we talk about itinerant teaching. <coughs> I promise you, we'll, we'll get to how to do it, but I don't want to jump ahead of what we're doing right now. I say that all the time, but I promise you, we will do the, the things I'm putting on. What did you start to say? What? Kate, you started to say. I know, I was just going to say, but what if the person's, like, the wife still lives there, but you said you get to Like I so. said, this problem. I mean, you know, what am I supposed to say? You kick her in the head? <laughs> <laughs> no, but this exposes our issues. Oh, but I understand. It is a problem. I but I'm, and I am going to give some, some ways of dealing with it. The, the best way to deal with it is not do it there. <laughs> do it in your office or someplace you control instead of there. And, but it, it's a bigger issue than interviewing. Every time you go there to teach, you run into the same problem. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all itinerant teaching. So. Okay. Anyway, so here we are with the, the second step. Then you show up at the door. And you just do these very, or you call the person first, and you do this beginning opening thing, this very simple stuff. I'm this person, and I've been referred by that person. And when can we come? And when can I come and meet you? Very simple. And your form. And your form. Huh? That's not the second step. No. That's the opening. That's the first step of the. Opening. Well, that's in the preparation. Opening. No. That's, that's step two. two parts of the in the opening. opening. Remember now, there's a preparation. Mm -hmm. Where you're getting all ready, yep, yep. and then there's the opening where you contact the person. The first contact is by telephone. That's the first part of the opening. Mm -hmm. And the second part is you walk up to the door and you do another kind of opening, which is kind of the same except it's not over the phone. I'm so and so. Here I am. We talked on the phone. It's formal. You call them Ms. or Mrs. or Mr. or Dr. or whatever they are. Do you think too like? In some organizations, um, like you said before, there's probably like some type of secretary or receptionist that might even call and set up the appointment with, you know, say Mr. Jones or whatever. You would typically probably even call them before to just introduce yourself at least before you show up at their door, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's what I want. You have to. You got to get a feel for the person. You 
because sometimes you sometimes in this opening you'll also get a feel for how they feel about you how receptive they're going to be oh the training and everything yeah you okay. know you talk to them you're going to get if they don't if they don't want any part of it you're going to get a feel for it and that helps by telephone okay so, mm -hmm. all right so then then you show up and you do the interview and then after the interview you've got to figure some 